Firstly, we'd love to hear your questions and you can submit these using the chat box on your screen. As we have a large audience this evening, you won't see everyone on screen yourself and we have muted all participants to limit the background noise. So do use the chat box. The earlier you do this, the better chance you have of, 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 of um, us covering your question and covering as many questions as possible. So don't be shy, we're here to answer your concerns. And finally, as we mentioned in the welcoming email, we'll be recording tonight's session so that it's available to others online. If you prefer to not be part of this, please remove yourself from uh, the video link and stay with us on audio. So without further ado, I have great pleasure in introducing to your host tonight, Dr. Marilyn Graham. Now Marilyn is a full-time GP working in a South London practice and has been a GP for over 30 years. She has a special interest in women's health and in pediatrics. As well as being part of our health group here at Bell House, she's a mum to four grown-up children and she's hoping that soon, one day soon, she'll be cuddling, the baby she'll be cuddling will be her own grandchild. I'd say, uh, Marilyn, be careful what you wish for. Um, I like my sleep and I'm sure you do too. So over to Marilyn. So thank you, Louise, for that, that very kind introduction um, and, a, and a special welcome to um, our, our speaker tonight, who's David, David Elliman. Um, David is a semi-retired community paediatrician, but he's, based, he's now based mainly at Great Ormond Street and works for Public Health England about, mainly about childhood screening programmes. All his career, he's had a special interest in childhood vaccinations. He's written really fantastic academic articles for, for doctors. He's been involved in teaching and training doctors, nurses and health visitors. But he often does talks like this. He speaks to parents um, who have questions and, 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 and is really good at, at explaining things at a GP level and at, at a mother's level. Um, and I hope that we'll really be able to get lots of interesting facts from David. So David, welcome to you. Um, and thank you so much for giving your time tonight. Um, if I can be cheeky, I'd like to ask the first question really. And that is really, what are the main types of vaccinations that we use now, David? And, and how safe are they? Well, the, the main types, I suppose, you can divide them into two. Those vaccines that are the live germs which have been turned down, toned down so that they are unlikely to cause the disease but are still alive. And examples of that would be the MMR and the rotavirus and the BCG. Uh, but most vaccines are dead vaccines. Either they are the whole germ that has been killed or they're a part of the germ or something that's been produced artificially, which contains the bit of the germ that stimulates the immune system. So the immune system thinks it's the germ, produces antibodies. So when you come across the disease, those antibodies are there to protect you. Um, you could divide them further, but that gets into the detail, which I don't think is necessary. In terms of how safe are they? Well, um, you will know about the coronavirus vaccine that people are looking to produce. And some people have been talking about producing it on October, more realistically next year. Now, if they do produce it within a year, that would be a record out of all imagination because most vaccines take 10, 20 years to produce. Part of that is seeing if they work, but also part of it is seeing if they're safe. So there are very, very strict regulations around how you test a vaccine. You start on a small group of healthy adults, often medical students in my day. Uh, you then expand it to a larger group, and then you expand it to an even larger group, which may be tens of thousands of people who are your target population if you like so the people you would be giving it to and there are very strict regulations as to how you monitor the safety of the vaccine so for the short term you give people diaries to keep take their baby's temperature record how well they are and in the longer term you would send them questionnaires or contact them over the phone and then you 
license the vaccine, but it doesn't finish there. Once it's been introduced, everybody, every healthcare professional is asked to report anything that could be a side effect, a significant side effect of the vaccine. They don't have to know it is, it just seems to be that it has followed on from the vaccine. All that data is recorded centrally and if there seem to be a lot of issues cropping up, for example, lots of children seem to have a particular reaction, then there would be some specific inquiry and perhaps research done into that particular problem. So it's a long drawn out process before you license the vaccine, but it then continues through the whole life of the vaccine. It's a continuous process. So the answer to your question, how safe are they? is that anybody who said a vaccine was without side effects frankly would be a liar because I know of nothing we do that is without side effects but they are usually minor side effects so mm -hmm. a temperature perhaps being a bit off colour and if it's an injection a reaction at the site of the injection and that's fairly frequent for vaccines whether they're childhood or adult. There are much less common reactions for example, with a temperature, you may have what's called a febrile fit. Um, these are uncommon with the ages at which we give the vaccines at two, three, four months. Commoner in the States where the last of those vaccine is given at six months. They do also occur after the MMR. But when you compare how frequently they occur after the vaccine with how frequently after the disease, they occur 10 times more likely after the disease than after the vaccine. So the, the balance is very much in favour of the vaccine. Thank you. Um, we've got some questions in writing um, and I think we might we might um, ask you a couple of those David. Um, so there was one specific one we've touched on it already and that's about temperatures. Um, and that was about a, 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 a little one of 16 weeks who had a very nasty temperature and the mother was concerned about, you know, if I give, the, if I give my little one some, another vaccine, am I, going to, am I going to get the same reaction or really high fever? And how could, I, how could I prevent that? Is there any sort of pattern? If, one, if you get a, basically, if you get a temperature, a nasty temperature once, are you going to get it for other future vaccines? Um, the answer to that is you may. Um, the immunizations that would be given at 16 weeks would be the six in one, which can give you a temperature, and the meningitis B or meningococcal B. The meningococcal B is what's called a, a reactogenic vaccine, and that means it does give rise to reactions. So temperatures, sore limbs being off colour are not uncommon. And that's why it's advised that with that immunization, the baby should be given paracetamol, one dose at around the time of the vaccine, and then two doses following it. The next series of vaccines would be due at a year or 13 months old, which are the first MMR and then boosters of some of the others. Now, I've just mentioned that after the MMR, you can get a temperature and you can get a what's called a febrile convulsion. Now, the advice at that age would not be to give paracetamol as a preventative, but only to give it if the baby has a temperature and seems to be off colour with the temperature. So if it's a one year old who's started to crawl, walk around the furniture and they feel a bit hot, but are still feeding well, walking around the furniture, nothing else has changed. You would not usually give them paracetamol just to treat the temperature. We used to in the past, but for many years now, the advice has been not to do that, except with a very specific instance of where you're giving the meningococcal B vaccine at eight and 16 weeks. Yes, and we offer, offer mothers that uh, paracetamol, we keep doses in the surgery specifically to give the meningitis B, which is standard practice. Um, there was another question around, um, you know, we can't, we can't sort of forget that we're in this COVID epidemic and, and there is some nervousness, I'm quite sure, 
about uh, bringing babies in for vaccines. Um, uh, is there anything, David, you think um, a general comment about that? I can talk specifically about what, what arrangements we're making in our practice, but have you got any um, anything to sort of say to mums about worried about their newborns having little ones about having vaccines during COVID? Well, I, it's a perfectly understandable reaction because the advice has been, in essence, keep away from people. And we don't have a way that you can give vaccines by Zoom at the moment. When we do, be much easier but we don't have that yet so it has to involve contact with a practice nurse or whoever's giving the vaccine one of the very reassuring things about this is that children don't often get infected and when they do get infected they are less likely to have severe disease than adults it's different from the flu where they are often infected and they spread it around it's a different disease. But the other thing to bear in mind is that the reason we vaccinate children when they're young is to protect them against diseases that occur when they're young. We've mentioned meningococcal B, um, whooping cough, um, measles at a year old. The timing of those vaccines has been decided because we want to protect the children against those diseases. So taking those two factors into account, the advice has been consistently through this, that children's vaccines are a high priority, that parents should go and get them, and that GPs should put in place the precautions I'm sure you've got in your surgery, Marilyn. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'd like to reassure everyone that if they go to their GPs now, it'll be quite a different experience. You'll probably be almost alone in the waiting room. You'll be brought in a time when the nurse is... Um, basically all the rooms are basically free uh, you'll see that there will be a totally different entrance for what we call well patients that have not got any COVID symptoms to um, non-COVID and sometimes these are actually in different buildings so you'll be going into a place that's being cleaned after every patient you'll be not sitting in a waiting room with other patients you're brought in when it's empty and you'll be in there for a very very few minutes there'll be no waiting around in the waiting room anymore you'll be checked in and you'll be straight into the nurse so I hope that the parents will feel that it's a very streamlined quick event getting a vaccine now um, and the feedback I've had from the patients in my surgery is exactly that. Um, I, a chance I went along to get my pneumococcal vaccine I was called for that and I went to my local surgery I didn't have to wait and I can't remember seeing any other patients in the surgery. That's right it's empty. Um, Louise you were going to read another question around um, a little one that's been ill uh, after or uh, near the time after a vaccine. Could you read that question to us? Yes, thank you, Marilyn. I think this was provided by um, someone called Caroline. And um, the question was that the mum had had a really bad experience at a 16th, uh, 16 month vaccination for her child, which has really put her off um, further vaccinations. And she said that my child experienced a fit, an epileptic fit is the term she used, whether, whether it was, I'm not sure, when she had her 16 month uh, vaccination. And the question is, you know, how, how can you reassure her for future um, vaccinations? Um, if it was truly 16 months, I imagine those were the vaccinations that would normally have been given at a year, but for some delayed. And those would be the MMR and then boosters mm -hmm. of things like uh, meningitis B, a dose of meningitis C and Hib, um, and pneumococcal vaccine. If um, one is going to have a temperature due to that bunch of vaccines it may occur within the first couple of days but for the MMR it occurs something like a week afterwards. If it was related to the MMR then we know that there's a proportion of children as I've said that may have a convulsion what's called a febrile convulsion convulsion with a fever at about a week or so after the MMR. Now it's something specific about that age between about six months and 18 months, where children are much more likely to have febrile convulsions. The next vaccines 
leaving aside the flu vaccine, which is quite different, the next vaccines would be due at about three years and four months old, when the chance of having a febrile convulsion is very, very, very much less. And one of the things about live vaccines is that in fact, with subsequent doses, you are less likely to have a reaction. So if this was a reaction to the MMR, it is very unlikely that the same thing would occur with a three month, three year, four month second dose of MMR. Um, the other mm. thing I would say is that uh, children have febrile convulsions quite commonly. So it's sometimes quite difficult to say whether it was due to the vaccine or the child had another infection and it was purely coincidence. It's often very difficult to work out. Okay. We have another question about MMR, Louise. We've got a sort of follow up to that one. Uh, so yes, we've got a follow up to that particular question actually, which I'll read if it's okay, from Aisty uh, Rimkuvienne, I think. Um, she says, my daughter, my first daughter reacted very badly to MMR, uh, where after two weeks of getting, when after get two weeks of getting it, she ended up in hospital. She needed to get an IV as she was so weak. Doctors at the hospital didn't relate this to the vaccination, or I felt I hadn't been heard by them. That was seven years ago. I'm very scared to vaccinate my little one who is two years old and did not have her MMR yet. So I think that's that's quite a, quite a big concern to that, that parent. Well, just as with the febrile convulsions, it's difficult to relate any illness that comes after a vaccine to be definite that it's due to the vaccine. Um, but to assume it is, my comment would be the same as before, that after subsequent doses, mm. much less likely to happen. And the other thing is that there's no evidence that reactions to vaccines run in a family. So just because one person has had a reaction doesn't mean to say the other would. Um, yeah. In fact, way back when I was a junior doctor, um, some parents came to ask my advice about some twins they had. Um, they were worried about the MMR and I advised that they should go ahead with it. And they did with one of the twins, not with the other. And one of the twins had a febrile convulsion. In fact, it was the twin that didn't have the vaccine that had the febrile convulsion because they had another illness going on at the time. I can, and I can certainly um, sort of relate from my general practice that, uh, you know, one child in a family can have a febrile convulsion when they have a, some sort of virus um, and yet have gone through all the vaccines without ever having had any problems with febrile convulsions. So unfortunately, they are really scary if your child has a febrile convulsion. It's one of the scariest things, I think, as a parent to watch your child have, have a convulsion. Um, but, but I think, as David's explained, they do happen to children of a certain age, normally between six and 18 months, associated with a fever. And that's all sorts of fevers and really may be nothing to do with a vaccine at all. And, and, and we see that, um, you know, and I can think of numerous children that have had them uh, and, and have had their vaccines without any issues at all. Um, around talking about MMR, David, um, we're still asked at times about having an MMR with its components separately, um, which is something we've never, as far as I can remember in, in my history of being a GP, ever done in, in general practice. But there have been odd clinics around the country that have done that. Um, can you give any comment as to as to if, if parents are sort of thinking about it? I mean, we encourage them not to do that, but can you give perhaps a little bit of a more rounded answer? This was a question that came from one of the um, one of the one of the people tonight about having separate vaccines. I know the people have different reasons for asking for the separate vaccines. Um, often people assume that the reason they're asking is because they're worried about autism and certainly many years ago that was the case uh, and they will say they're worried about autism because there was a paper published in a medical journal that said there was a link with autism. I always ask them did you read the paper because in fact the paper did not say there was a link. 
um, what the paper was about was a link between autism and gut problems. And the MMR was a sort of follow on. They said, you know, it looks as though more children than you might have expected had had the MMR. This needs further looking into. But they were very clear, and I think their exact words were, we did not prove an association between the vaccine and autism and bowel problems. It was one of the authors who made a public statement saying he thinks the government ought to provide the single vaccines that caused the problem. It was a paper that had 13 medical authors on it. Ten of them wrote to the journal very soon after he'd made this statement saying we support the continuing use of MMR. So the, the feeling that there was a paper that said there was a link that caused the problem is not true. It was a particular author. Um, at the time, there wasn't research that had been done to say no, this wasn't a link because there's no reason to think there would be a link. Subsequently, there's been oodles of papers, dozens of papers written from you know, all sides of the world using different methods that have shown no evidence of a link between MMR and autism. And I think one can say the whole weight of scientific evidence is very clearly on that side. I think one of the difficulties in the early days is that um, there was a feeling that there was a balance, if you like. There were some people who said there was a link, equal numbers who said there wasn't, and there was a false impression given. The overwhelming view amongst the scientific and medical community is that there isn't a link. No government in the world, no health body in the world has changed their practice because of that. So if it's a concern about a link with autism, then the scientific evidence is very clear. Some parents have a more um, diffuse concern, shall I say. It's not about autism in particular, it's about giving combinations of vaccines in general that is the worry. Um, whenever a vaccine is introduced, I've described how its safety is tested. Now, usually, for example, the MMR vaccine um, replaced measles vaccine. So people looked at the side effects of the measles vaccine against the side effects of the MMR, see if there are any different side effects and if there are any more common. And there are no more side effects than you get with the individual vaccines and that they are no more common. So going the route of giving them separately means more injection and trauma for the baby but no benefit for the baby so that's the if you like the scientific evidence the reality is that i don't think you can get them separately in this country uh, there was a time when you could but i think even the private clinics can't give all three i think there's still a difficulty i think it's with the mumps you can get measles separately but not the other two if you do get them, they are not necessarily licensed for use in this country, not because someone's found them safe, but they haven't maintained their license. Um, but there was a period when single mumps vaccine was being used, where there were a whole variety of them, from ones that didn't work at all, to ones that gave more side effects than the ones we do use. So if you do go the single route, you probably can't get all three anyway, cost you a lot of money, and also you can't guarantee, if you like, the pedigree of them, and they won't have been through the same processes that we put through the vaccines that are given through the NHS. Thank you, David. Um, coming back to, so, I mean, coming back to that, that, the, that, uh, that discussion we had about um, the febrile convulsion and the lady that was asking, um, somebody has followed up saying, um, and yes, so the question is from Marissa actually, um, what is a febrile convulsion and what should you do if your child has this reaction? So I think we've started using a term that perhaps not everybody um, Sorry. understands. Well, I think that's my fault. So David, do you want to just um, give a summary of what A febrile convulsion is a convulsion that, um, as we've said, a baby mainly between six and 18 months. Though if they've already had one, it can go on a bit longer than that. They, 
they may have more, is a convulsion with a fever. The fever doesn't have to be because of a severe illness, doesn't have to be meningitis or anything of that nature. It can be quite a minor illness. And it's really the height of the fever and probably the rate that it goes up that matters. And this causes the child to have a convulsion, another name, a fit, um, which is usually short lived. And as Marilyn has said, is very, very worrying for a parent. Um, and by the time, if you like, you've got your act together, it's usually finished. Um, and so it's not like an epileptic convulsion that will go on a long time. It's uncommon that you need to do anything and it'll finish of its own accord. If it's the first one that a child has had, we would very strongly advise that you seek medical advice because you want to make sure that there is nothing serious behind it and not necessarily assume that it's just a minor illness or due to the vaccine. There are some children who have recurrent febrile convulsions and then their parents are able to assess whether or not they need to seek medical advice. But as I say, they're usually short lived. And by the time that you've sort of gathered your wits about you, they'll have finished. And they are very, very, very unlikely to lead to any long term problems. They do run in families a bit. So if you've had a child who's had a febrile convulsion, it's slightly more likely that another child will do so. But it's not as strong as something like the colour of your eyes or your blood group or something of that nature. So when you say seek medical attention, um, David, I mean, are you telling, are you saying that parents, um, I mean, we always say after a first fit, if it's the first time, in fact, mothers and everyone are so scared when they first see it, they always, virtually always do seek medical attention. Um, but I mean, there are, of course, other causes of fits in children, although we're talking about the febrile, and that's what you're really saying, that we must check that there isn't anything else going on with the baby, really. That's right. And it may be that you um, ring up for an ambulance, the ambulance comes, the paramedics, by the time they arrive, the child's sitting up, beaming, and no problem. They may say, well, this looks all right. Um, so that it doesn't necessarily mean going to hospital or you may go to hospital, see by a doctor who sends you home again. And as I say, that's probably appropriate that something of that nature happens the first time around. But if it's happening subsequently and the parents themselves are now accustomed to what it is, they may make the assessment themselves because they know their child. They know if they're basically well or not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we often get um, mums coming in, um, having read about the vaccines, David. Um, and of course, when we talk about the vaccine, there are six in one. So the vaccines we give to an eight week baby, there are three vaccines and one of the vaccines has six different components in. And when people read about this, they get very worried about how much illness, inverted commas, are we giving their little baby in eight weeks? Um, could you just sort of give us an overview? Because it does sound a lot if you think one injection has six different components and it's all been put into one injection. You know, is that too much for a little immune system? And, and then we also give a rotavirus and a and MMV at the same time. Could you just sort of T tell tell me, I've heard you give this explanation before, about, about, about how this could affect an eight-week-old baby, because I think people are very concerned that we're giving them too much of a vaccine. Well, I think there are lots of components to the answer. One is that your immune system is able to combat lots of things at the same time. Um, and the number of things we give in vaccines are relatively minor. Um, another Thing that's worth thinking about is you say the six in one vaccine it's got lots of things in it well actually if you look at the history of the production of vaccines and the number of things in the vaccines on the whole it's gone down the old whooping cough vaccine that we used to use had something like 3,000 bits and pieces in it that stimulated the immune system 
The one we use now, depending upon the exact brand, either has three or five components in it. So that's gone down enormously. So the number of things that the immune system is being confronted with, if you like, is very small in comparison with what it used to be. So that's the, if you like, the theory bit. In practice, people have actually looked at children who've had a number of vaccines and are they more likely to end up in hospital in a few weeks after it because they've had an infection, which might be something you would think about if you're thinking that the immune system would be overwhelmed in some way and therefore couldn't cope with other things they don't end up in hospital more frequently with other infections. And the other thing that sometimes people worry about is another upset to the immune system, namely autoimmunity. So diseases like diabetes, that sort of thing. Can vaccines cause those because they in some way damage the immune system? People who've looked at that, it is not more common in children who've had vaccines. So there's lots of evidence and there's no reason to think there would be a problem. Okay. Um, we've got Angela somewhere and she's asked sort of the, the ultimate, I think, question. So she says, if a baby's immune system is able to deal with so many things well, why don't we just let their immune system deal with things rather than give them any vaccines at all? Well, if you could guarantee that someone who got whooping cough or measles would not suffer any ill effects from those diseases, then that would be fine. But we do know that people die of measles, unfortunately, in the not too distant past. There was a, a baby that died of measles, I think it was in southwest London, about three or four years ago. Um, and that was a baby who was too young to be immunized. Um, there have been previous children die of measles as well, even in the relatively modern era. We still see children dying of whooping cough. So the best thing to do if we can do it is stimulate their immune systems, but in a controlled way. And that's what vaccination is about, stimulating the immune system so that it's like having the illness from the immune system's point of view, so that hopefully they don't get it again but in a controlled way, so they're unlikely to have any of the serious effects of the disease. So the reason we give the vaccine is because we're doing it in a controlled way. The natural infection is not at all controlled and may well kill a child, unfortunately, even today. Yes, and to follow on, we did have a measles outbreak in southwest London. Um, only in the last couple of years, we've had quite a lot of measles. And in our practice alone, we had, we had a number of children who were unvaccinated, ended up in hospital um, with quite a serious, you know, quite a serious illness. So I think what, what, what sometimes we do is, is we, don't, we don't see these illnesses so much. People forget that the illness itself can be quite nasty. Well, quite I think serious. one of the things about covid is that if it does put people off being immunized then things like measles may increase markedly and we have to remember and covid has proven the point that although we're an island we're not isolated so other people if they have problems with increases in measles and there's a major worry about increases in polio that may put our population at risk so again, another reason why it's even more important to be immunized. Can I ask a question there, David? Why do different countries have different vaccination times and schedules then? Um, because obviously the more um, we work together, the stronger everything is, but there does seem to be some variation between different countries. There is. Um, it used to be that you could almost find as many different variations around Europe as there were European countries. Most of those variations tend to be in timing rather than the immunizations that are given. Um, the exceptions being the meningococcal mm -hmm. C and the meningococcal B. And those two are not, uh, don't have the same frequency in different countries. 
in the States, for example, they don't use the meningococcal B vaccine. They have another strain of meningitis that's much more important. And it does vary in Europe and around the world. So part of it is that different diseases have different frequencies, but more often than not, it's historical and to some extent what fits in with the health service as well. Um, if you know, you're visiting a GP at eight weeks for some other reason, that's a good time to start. When our schedule was designed or redesigned because it has changed with experience people looked at what are the diseases that are really going to kill young children and they were things like whooping cough the meningitis and something called hib and if you leave giving those vaccines too late you will have missed the peak period it is true if you give them early as we do they may not last as long you may need to give boosters and so we have boosters in our schedule um, but in terms of the vaccines given there isn't so much variation it's usually on the timing that varies um thank you um eczema lots of um patients talk about the correlation um with eczema and skin complaints and vaccines, David, what's the sort of evidence around babies getting problems with their skin after having vaccines? One of the difficulties, if you like, is that babies develop a lot of things in their first year of life. They develop eczema, we've discussed febrile convulsions, um, there are a number of other things, and it's a question of sorting out whether this is purely coincidence that we give MMR at the same time people have febrile convulsions or when it becomes apparent that you've got eczema is usually in your first year of life that can come on much later and so purely by coincidence we are going to have children who have a vaccine and something happens after it so what you need to do is proper scientific studies of children who have and haven't had eczema and is one group more likely to be immunized than the other no there's no difference so one can understand why people make the link especially with very common things like eczema and febrile convulsions and asthma but when you do the science if you like it turns out to be coincidence yeah. um and the other thing is that um it's the same sort of argument i think you're going to explain again but the when we start talking about developmental delay and that children are starting to not perhaps reach their milestones like crawling and walking and sitting up and things exactly when we think they should do and and mothers quite quite you know reasonably think well could it have been something to do with vaccines again david can you sort of just tell us that when studies just tell us about the studies that have been done around developmental delay and um, and one of the things that has been around is still around relates to the content of vaccines um, one of the particular issues is around aluminium and um, some very particular groups of researchers saying they think there is a link between aluminium in vaccines and things like developmental delay so people have specifically looked to see if children who've been vaccinated or have had more vaccines are more likely to have developmental delays and related problems, and they find no difference. And have there been quite a lot of studies like this? I mean, are these big There have been three or four done on quite a large number of children, both in this country and in the States. Okay, right. Um, in the last sort of couple of um, minutes, David, um, people are talking a lot about the, uh, the COVID vaccine um, and, you know, whether, whether as children are not going to be um, uh, affected by COVID, whether children, um, it's one of the things that I was asked today at the surgery, will, will children be off the COVID vaccine? And I said, well, we don't even know if there is going to be a vaccine, but do you think children will be offered a COVID vaccine if it does come out because they're not, very, they're not affected or what's your feeling? Or can you not I, I think there are 
that there are difficulties around the vaccine, producing it, being sure that it works. Then there will be uh, difficulties around producing enough for everybody. And it's very clear, um, I was watching a webinar at lunchtime, that this is not work that a single pharmaceutical company does in a single country. This is international work with pharmaceutical companies cooperating so we can give it to everybody who needs it around the world. Now that is an enormous big ask. So I imagine, at least in the early stages, people will look at those people who are at greatest risk of having the disease and developing complications. So that's going to be the elderly, people with chronic disorders, um, that sort of group. And also the people who may be sources of infection to others. Now for flu, children are a very, very major source of infection for others. At the moment, the evidence is not so clear with COVID, but if anything, it's not like flu. Children aren't a big source of concern in terms of spreading it. So on that, those two bases, children don't spread it very much probably, and also they don't get the disease severely. Uh, they would be put fairly low down the list of people who would be getting the vaccine. Um, so my guess is that they will be, you know, not an afterthought, but not the top priority by a long shot. Well, thank you very much indeed for answering those questions. And I, I hope that we've been able to answer some of the questions that have come in tonight. Um, and, and perhaps to be able to reassure one or two people about specific, specific issues. Um, we're very happy if uh, there are some more questions that we will try and in about two or three time, three, two or three weeks time, we'll put some sort of answers on the Bell House blog. So if you have got a question that you don't think has been answered or you haven't answered it clearly, we will try and answer some. We'll put them all out in about three weeks time with a blog. So um, there is now a chance to still get a question answered if you haven't had a chance tonight. So thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you to Bell House Pleasure. for organising uh, all, all of this. And thank you for asking questions. And as I say, if, if you want to ask one, um, please do, and we'll try and get back to you on the blog. We're going to do one, one answer to all of the questions in about three weeks' time. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much, Louise, for asking. Can I add my thanks? Yeah. Yeah. Can I add my thanks to you, Marilyn, for your enthusiasm and your very precious time? We really appreciate that. Um, those of you who are with us might like to know that at Bell House, we have a, an online new mums group, which offers weekly virtual drop-in sessions so that you can get together and provide support and receive support for all the challenges um, of becoming a new mum. So do have a look at those and there is also um, a, a resource um, pack on vaccinations on our website. Uh, now you'll find all of this on bellhouse.co.uk so I'd recommend that you have a look at that and you'll find the blog that Marilyn has mentioned there also. So thank you to our speakers. Um, thank you to Fabienne who has organized us tonight. And especially thank you to everybody who's taken the time to tune in. Um, thank you for joining us and please stay in touch in future. Good night.